Say amen. 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 It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Can we turn the monitor down. I know some of you 
may have been expecting to see someone else standing before you this morning. So those of you who are viewing over the airways, don't try to adjust your computer screens. <laughs> I would just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our bishop, as well as his lovely wife, who throughout this whole pandemic has still been making sure that we've had an opportunity to have church. Through, it, through the morning Bible studies, as well as making sure that we stay in compliance with whatever the rules may have been set down by the uh, local government. We have not missed a beat in being able to still give the Lord praise. And I want to take this opportunity also to just bless the Lord, brothers and sisters, for keeping his people. All glory belongs to him. We see on a weekly basis in the news that there is a constant threat of this deadly virus. But for whatever reason, the Lord has seen fit for his people to withstand it. Even though that there are many of us who work in an environment where we have to deal with the public up close and personal. But praise God! for his covering. We are eternally grateful. Brothers and sisters, I got word this week about a dear sister who is near to me who has contracted the virus. And I'd like to just take a moment to extend a prayer on her behalf. So if you would, shall we pray? Father in heaven, Lord, you say that we have not because we ask not. We dare not make that same mistake on today. Father, you said that if we have any cares, we should bring them to thee. Oh, Father, we bring you this care of our dear sister and her health. We ask that you might right the wrong. We ask that you will recover her body. We ask that you will raise her up. Oh Lord, we pray not because that we are worthy, but because Jesus is worthy. And you said that it would be by his stripes that we are healed. So Father, we are depending on you, asking you for mercy this morning for healing in Jesus name amen amen I tell you it's uh, been a while since I've had the opportunity to stand before you in this setting and uh, I do not take it lightly I am ever so grateful for the opportunity to spend time with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John. And we will be reading and you're hearing from chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. We're going to need all of those verses today. Amen. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. If you have that, say amen. Amen. And the Bible reads, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized four disciples in John, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea 
and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to talk with you for just a few moments on the subject of crossing boundaries. Crossing boundaries. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you at this time, Father, just thank you for another opportunity to be in the land of the living. Oh, Lord, I come now asking, Father, that you will use me, use this vessel to be your mouthpiece for your people. And I pray, Father, when all is said and done, that your people will be edified. But most of all, Father, you will be glorified by the things that are said in this place today. So we ask this, Father, in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Crossing boundaries. Brothers and sisters, Jesus crossed boundaries to encounter humanity to conquer our salvational needs. He crossed boundaries. As we saw in the scripture, it says, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Brothers and sisters, this story sends harmonic tremors into our own country's history. There was a time in our not too distant past when we ardently or, or, or passionately, if you will, did our best to keep differing people separate. We had separate drinking fountains, separate schools, separate baseball leagues, separate restaurants, separate neighborhoods. And then, during the 1950s and 1960s, the long established and unquestioned system of segregation was challenged. Active efforts were taken to cross the established boundaries. Nonviolent protests were organized. Sit-ins at segregated lunch counters were planned. Buses were boycotted. Marchers cross bridges. Amen. In September of 1957, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas became desegregated. Nine outstanding and very courageous African American students were selected to attend the school which formerly had been exclusively for white students. It was a dangerous boundary to cross. The National Guard had to be brought in to keep peace. I think we learned about first responders earlier. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our race relations are by no means healed. Amen. We see the current state of affairs in our country today. Amen. We can find unlimited ways of dividing ourselves into opposing camps, be it through religious affiliations, nationality, 
men and women, affluent and destitute. We often use fences to separate boundaries. You know, there's a saying that good fences make good neighbors. But Jesus on this day, brothers and sisters, had crossed the fence line and entered into Samaria. Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save all of mankind. So the question today, brothers and sisters, is how did Jesus intend to save all of mankind? Well, I would like to take a moment for us to look at just a few ways how Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save all of mankind. The first way that we'll look at how Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save mankind is that he was about his father's business. Jesus was about his father's business. Look at the text, and I want us to notice verses 1 and 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Notice the Bible says that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptized, and he had made and baptized more disciples than John. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that John had a head start. John had started baptized and before Jesus began his ministry. As a matter of fact, John baptized Jesus. So John had a head start, but the Bible says that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Jesus was about his father's business. Jesus was taking care of business. When he came into this world, when he started his ministry, he was about making sure that everyone had an opportunity to have salvation. And brothers and sisters, what he was showing us with that as well is this, that it doesn't matter when you come into the knowledge of Christ. It doesn't matter when your ministry starts. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the fold. You could just start today, and you could go out and witness and bring folks into the knowledge of Christ more people than someone who's been here for 10 years. So it doesn't matter when you start. It's about simply starting. Oh, he was showing us that, hey, if you're about the Father's business, then it's not a competition. It's just about being about the Father's business. Going out and making disciples, going out and sharing with people the word of Christ. We are living in a lost world today, brothers and sisters. We need to be about our father's business. But in order to do that, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to cross some boundaries. Amen. There are going to be some boundaries that you have to cross. It's not going to be easy. But yet and still, we need to be about our father's business. Let me show you another example of how Jesus was about his father's business. Turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Luke. And we're going to look at chapter 2, uh, verses, ah, I have 46 up on the board, but in order to, to, to do this thing justice, um, let's pick up at 41, and, and, and that's not going to be up there, but let's pick up at 41, because I want us to get the whole picture. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Now, now notice, they said his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. So see again, about the Father's business, making sure we are obedient. You know, his parents were obedient, and we're going to see in the next verse that um, he at 12 years old is where this particular story picks up. You know, he too was following the ordinance that was put in place by his father about three times a year. You would have to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. 
All right. So go ahead, pick up at 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So here it is, they went up to Jerusalem as it was their custom for the very first uh, feast day. So we know that we have the, as they told us in 41, you have the feast of Passover, but right at sunset began the feast of unleavened bread. So let's look and see what happens. 43. And when they had filled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So check this out. So after the feast, after the celebration was over, um, the, the, the parents, they started home, and Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first, but we're going to see how they came to find out that Jesus wasn't with them. Go ahead, 44. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. So they thought that they were not just traveling with just their family. There was a bunch of relatives that was on this pilgrimage as well because everybody was required to travel to Jerusalem for this particular feast. And so they didn't see him right there nearby, but they thought that he may have been with some other family members who was traveling with them. But it wasn't until the evening that they noticed that he was not there. Go ahead. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. So now they do. When a day's journey, they left, and here it is. They was, I'm assuming it was about to make camp as evening came, and they noticed that Jesus wasn't with them. Now we're talking about these are the parents, right? Many of us have children in here. You think about it. If you didn't travel the whole day, and you're 12, all of a sudden you realize that your 12-year-old child is not with you, that's a problem. Oh, that's a big problem. All parents in here understand that now all of a sudden you realize that one of your children is missing? Oh, so the Bible lets us know that here it is, they got into a frantic, all right, when they realized, go ahead, 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem. So he it is, he wasn't with them. So they, 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 the last place that we know that he was was in Jerusalem. They went back searching. Maybe he, he may be somewhere along the way. Maybe he's still in Jerusalem. We got to go and find our child. There's not a parent in here that wouldn't be frantic after traveling the whole day thinking that their child was with them, but then coming to realize at the end of the day that you've been traveling for however many hours it was, and now all of a sudden, your child is not there. Amen. Put down everything. Going back. I got to go find my kid. got to go find my kid. Go ahead. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, mm. both hearing them and asking them questions. So, a day's journey away, it took them a day to get back. So they're back in Jerusalem now, third day. They search and they search and then they go to the synagogue and they find him in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors. Twelve-year-old! Sitting with some doctors. Teachers of the law. Ooh. And the Bible said that he was sitting there both hearing them and asking them questions. Now you know, of course, Jesus was just trying to see where they were when he was asking them questions, right? Go ahead, pick up there. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. 12 years old. Think about this. How many 12-year-olds that you know can sit among doctors, sit among people who are educated and, 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 and be able to conversate with them and to the point where those educators, those people with all of those letters behind their names would be astonished, would be amazed of how much understanding that this 12-year-old has 
of the murderer. But they didn't know who he was. They didn't know who he was. So, you know, we can understand. So go ahead. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. So now here it is. They get back to the temple, right? And so Mary and Joseph, they see him there and they're amazed. Like, what in the world is he doing? Now, I guess she forgot who her son was. All right. But they were amazed that he was sitting in a temple amongst the doctors, amongst the educators, amongst those uh, amongst those religious leaders and just having a conversation um, talking about things that only those who are well educated would have any knowledge of. And so then they, she, she being um, astonished that he's still there saying, you know, what, what is it that you've done to us? Why have you done this to us? We've been in a frantic. We've been looking all over for you for the past three days. Searching everywhere. But notice what Jesus replied to. Verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Ooh. <laughs> Say, what you doing looking for? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I, I'm right here doing what I need to be doing. Like I said, she must have forgotten who her son was. He was taking care of business. He was sent here on a mission to make sure that we receive all that we need so that we can have salvation. So here it is. He's crossing boundaries by studying and speak, talking and, 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 and having conversation with doctors at the mere age of 12. Crossing boundaries. Ah, being about his father's business. Putting them in check. All right, because they doctors, they supposed to be the 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 uh, excellent educators and rulers of the of the law. But Jesus was just checking them, just making sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because he already know the work that he was about doing. He was about doing his father's business. And brothers and sisters, we need to be about our father's business. Amen. We need to be about our father's business. Now, I'm serious, brothers and sisters. You know, it's so many people out there, as I look and I see, and we all can see daily on the news that there's so much turmoil, there's so much, there's so much going on. We need to make sure we are about our Father's business. We need to make sure that we're sharing this word. We are in the last days, brothers and sisters. A lot of people don't realize that. If any of you have kept up with the readings and seen the things as they are transpiring in the world today and didn't know what the word of God says, Jesus said all that this was going to happen. Amen. It is happening right before our eyes. I expect it to be long gone before some of this stuff happened, but don't look like it's going to be that way. Who knows? But we need to make sure that we are about our father's business. Let me, let, me, let me show you where I am. All right, I want you to turn over to Psalms chapter 40. And I want us to look at verse 8, because this is where I am. And I pray that many of you are in the same zip code that I'm in. Psalms chapter 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I delight, I take joy in doing God's will. There's a whole lot of people out there that they have a problem with doing what God say. They have a problem because it's too many restrictions. It don't take all of that. I'm grown. I can do what I want to do. But brothers and sisters, I take joy. I delight in doing the will of God. See, by, it's, 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 it's hard for me to just sit idle. It's hard for me to just sit idle. Because I, 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 I find joy in doing the Father's will. And I was sharing with Bishop earlier that, you know, um, at work on a daily occasion, 
I often have an opportunity to insert some biblical knowledge into my colleagues. Uh, when I, yes, I'm still working for those of you who may be asking, I have not retired yet, amen. But uh, 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 during roll call, um, I happen to be uh, in a unit where it's doing my, the roll call that I attend, there's no females, it's all males. So a lot of the conversation is like men locker room conversation. And for those of you who've never been in a man's locker room, a lot of that conversation is about women. I'm just gonna put it out there. It's about women, all right? And so a lot of the conversation that takes place during roll call, once we get all of the information that we need, it's about women. And the majority of the men in there are married, but it's not about their wives, not those women. It's about women. So lo and behold, the Lord gives me an opportunity often to insert some scripture and try to help those who are, ah, for whatever reason, lacking. And, 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 and earlier this week, I had an opportunity, praise God, that um, the first hour, I had a whole hour, I had a platform for an hour to give some biblical scriptures to these brothers. And, 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 and because, you know, they were throwing stuff out at me, Brother John, they come time out. Well, all I have to do is just repent and, you know, God will forgive me. I said, oh, it ain't that easy, brother. It ain't that easy. I told them they need to stop going to these old feel-good preachers who just let them know that all you need to do because, see, if y'all would have tuned in last night, you would have found out that when you are disobedient, then the Lord work against you for evil. But see, that's not what the world is being told. You know, they feel like they can just repent, go out, sin again, repent, go out, sin again, repent, go out, sin again. I, said, I had to set them straight, Brother John. I had to set them straight. And the Lord gave me a platform for a whole hour. Got to the point where my supervisor said, all right, Verdine, you need to go out there and uh, do some work. But I delight, I take joy in doing his will and spreading his word. And see, that's why I don't understand how when we have this opportunity to, 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 to spread the word that we don't, you know, we, we try to shy away. We, when we're out in the public, when we uh, do things differently than what others do, be it praying, be it uh, whatever it may be, you know, and then people have a look at you all strange because you're doing things differently than what they do. And if they come up and ask you, why are you doing that? But see, you know, boy, I, I wish somebody would. Oh, I'm going to let you know why I do what I do. Gladly. Because I take delight in doing his will. Ah, but we need to be about our father's business, brothers and sisters. We need to be about our father's business. And it's going to... We're going to have to cross boundaries in order to do that. So, another way that Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save all of mankind is that he traveled to and fro to redeem mankind. Mm -hmm. He traveled to and fro to redeem mankind. Uh, pick up, go back to your text, and I want you to pick up at verse 3. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5. He left Judea. And departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. So here it is. He left Judea, and he was returning to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on his way. So it is crossing a boundary, crossing a boundary, and traveling to and fro. Because see, he didn't just stay in one spot mm -hmm. to deliver his word. You know, that he had to go, he had to travel, he had to go here and there and with, where have you in order to make sure that everybody 
who would receive did receive. So the Bible lets us know that here it is on this particular occasion he departed Judea and he was returning back to Galilee. And he had to go through Samaria and he got to a city called Sychar um, near the ground where Jacob had given to his son. But I want to show you on another instance just how much Jesus did travel. I just want to give you another account how Jesus did travel spreading the word. Uh, go to chapter 10 of the same book of John and I want us to look at verses 40 through 42. Jesus wasn't just sitting idle. And brothers and sisters, like I told you earlier, I, it's hard for me to just sit idle because I take joy in doing his will. And now, uh, pick up at verse 40. Jesus said unto her, uh, John 10, verse 40, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. So here it is, Jesus again. Now, of course, on this particular occasion, he had left Jerusalem and he had escaped being arrested. But he went and traveled beyond the Jordan River, near the place where John had, was first baptized. And the Bible says that many people followed him. Many resorted unto him. A lot of people followed him there. And while they were there, they were speaking among themselves, saying that now John didn't perform many miracles. He didn't do any miraculous signs. But all the things that he spoke of, this man, they have come true. So here it is, you know, John was sharing them all of the things that Jesus was going to do once he started his ministry, once he came and um, started to try to um, get disciples to follow him. And so there was a lot of miracles that was done that Jesus performed because, you know, he healed the blind. He allowed people who couldn't talk to him. He did a lot of miraculous things. And they said, now John didn't do any of those things. But he said, he spoke of a man who would do these things, and here it is. Everything that John said about him has come true. And so because of these things, they started believing on Jesus. They, 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 they started to follow Jesus. They was like, wow, John said this. But see, the thing of it is, brother and sister, that Jesus was about his father's business, and he was traveling to and fro to make sure that all who would hear could hear, and all who would see would be able to see, to make sure that they had the opportunity to accept Christ, accept God, turn away from their sinful ways, and go back and doing things the way God said do them. He traveled to and fro. He made sure that everybody had an opportunity to see. And so in doing so, we see that he even had a following, that people followed him because of the things that John had said about him and all of the miraculous signs that he had done. Now he started getting a following. Now people started believing on him. So again, he's just crossing boundaries to make sure that those who would have the opportunity to be saved, they would, they could, they would take heed to that opportunity. So, brothers and sisters, but what he's demonstrating to us is that we have to get out there and we have to make sure that we are doing our part. Amen. Amen. We have to make sure that we go to and fro. Amen. We can't just sit idle in one spot. People are not going to come to our doorsteps. Amen. We have to make sure that we get out there and spread the word of Christ because, again, as I said earlier, Amen. we are living in a world where Christ is not at the forefront. Amen. So here it is. Uh, so he was out. He went everywhere spreading the word, spreading the word. And so he also is letting us know that everywhere we go, 
we need to be spreading the word as well. He even lets us know over in Matthew 10 and 23, turn over there with me real quick. Matthew 10 and 23, he says this to us because he has an expectation for us to be out there spreading the word. So he gave this to his disciples, but it's extended to us as well. Notice what he said in this particular verse. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So here it is. We know that we're going to get persecution. We know that we're going to get slapped. We know that people are going to push back. But Jesus said that when they persecute you in this one city, then you flee to another. Go to another city and share his word. So if we just look at just the state of Texas, all right? Because he told them that you won't be able to reach every town in Israel before the Son of Man returns. Now, Texas is a whole lot bigger than Israel. A whole lot bigger than Israel. So you just think about it. If their job was to go out and spread the word from one city to the other, then what is our job, brothers and sisters? We need to make sure that we're out spreading this word. We will not be able to spread or to uh, go to every city in the state of Texas before Jesus returns. Jesus is, uh, Texas is a very large state. And so we have a responsibility, brothers and sisters, to make sure that we are out there doing what we're supposed to do. And that is to make sure that we are spreading the word of Jesus. Jesus has given us a command to go out and do that. We need to adhere to what it is that Jesus is asking us to do. Amen. So he tells his disciples that if they persecute you in one city, no problem. Go to another. And go to another. And you will not be able to go to every city in Israel. We will not be able to go to every city in Texas before Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, we have to go out and share this word to a dying society. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as we look at the news and on the media, there's, what I see, brothers and sisters, there's so much hatred in this world. There's so much hatred. People are not liking one another because they have a different agenda, because they have a different political views, because of what your ancestors did to my ancestors. And so we have hate. Jesus came and he was promoting love. And you know what's the bad part about it, brothers and sisters? There's a whole lot of Christians that are so-called Christians who are getting themselves mixed up in this hatred that is being shown across the way. Now, how is it that you're going to call yourself a Christian when Jesus came here to promote love and yet and still you are supporting this hatred movement? No one in here or no one that I know or no one in this world has been persecuted or tormented more so than what Jesus was. And yet and still when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, but they know not what they do. Yeah. But yet and still, we want to hold hatred in our heart. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, we need to get out there and start sharing this word. And we need to be the examples. We need to be the light to make sure to show folks that, hey, just because of what's going on, we can still love one another. Just because your agenda is different than mine, because you have a different philosophy than what I have, that don't mean I have to hate you. Right. This world is full of hate. And I'm going to tell you something. Heaven was made for lovers, not for haters. Amen. It was made for lovers. If you got hatred in your heart and you think that you're going to be, uh, oh boy, let me tell you something. You're going to be in for a, a, a rude awakening. A very rude awakening. But yes, brothers and sisters, we have to go out and we need to do our part. We need to be the example. We need to be the light of the world. We need to make sure that people know and understand that, hey, just because you have a different agenda, just because you have a different opinion, just because things that happened back in the past, and we cannot hold on to those things and just allow this hatred to continue to build in our hearts and build in our bodies. We will find ourselves on the outside as opposed to being what we are desiring to be. Amen. So we need to go out, brothers and sisters, 
We need to go to and fro. We need to cross boundaries. We need to make sure that we go out and do what we are supposed to do as Christians. So we see, brothers and sisters, that the first way that Jesus crossed boundaries was with the intent to save all of mankind was that he was about his father's business. And the second way that Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save mankind is that he traveled to and fro to redeem all of mankind. Lastly, brothers and sisters, our life was to look at how Jesus crossed boundaries with the intent to save all of mankind is that he didn't let cultural differences deter him. Amen. He didn't let cultural differences deter him. Let's go back to the text. And I want us to pick up at verse 7. And let's read 7 through 9. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me a drink, or give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Ooh, now check this out, brothers and sisters. So here it is. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus asked her, Give me to drink. Give me a drink. And so she was looking at Jesus like, looking at him like she couldn't believe that he was talking to her. Notice that the Bible said in verse 8 that for his disciples, he was by himself and all his disciples was gone away to the city to buy meat. They had went away to go buy some food, right? Because they were traveling. And again, they had just left Jerusalem and, um, and was uh, traveling back to Galilee. And so... They had stopped while they had stopped on their journey. They went to go buy food, and Jesus was up here at this well when this woman came and asked for a drink. When this woman came and he asked her, I should say, for a drink. And so the Bible say that the woman, then said that the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which, is, which am a woman of Samaria? So here it is. The woman was surprised. She couldn't believe that here it is, a Jew was asking someone from Samaria to give him a drink. Because see, brothers and sisters, the Jews treated the Samaritans as if they were a lower class citizen. And the Bible even lets us know that Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Oh, but see, brothers and sisters, don't miss the mess. Don't miss the message in this, right? The Jews thought of the Samaritans as a lower class citizen. But Jesus was showing us that we shouldn't frown upon another man just because we think that we're better than what he is. Yes, sir. Or because someone else is different. Yes, sir. This word that Jesus has for us is for everybody. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, and I remember and I, I must admit, you know, back when I was a young novice Walking in this faith, right? In this faith. All right? And, and, and when we would go out and witness, you know how you be looking at people like, I ain't going to talk to him because you know, he don't look like he's going to see. Oh, they ain't going to. You know, but see, as I have matured now, I realize that, hey, the very one who I turned away could be the very next bishop. Who knows? how the Lord would have worked with that person if I would have just given them the opportunity to hear what I had to say. Amen. So brothers and sisters, Jesus was letting us know just because they were less considered a less people than what the Jews were, that hey, you still got to spread this word. And so Jesus was showing us. But just to show you how un Orthodox of a scene that this was, I want you to just real quick, we want to drop down to verse 27, and we're going to see what the disciples thought about this when they returned and they saw Jesus talking to this woman. Verse 27, real quick. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? So here it is, because the Jews felt the way that they did about the Samaritans, right? When the disciples came back, the Bible say that they marveled 
They were shocked to find Jesus was talking to this woman. But notice the Bible said that none of them had the nerve to ask Jesus, why are you talking to this woman, Jesus? <laughs> none of them had the nerve to ask him. But that's just how strange, uh, how unorthodox this was. Because when they came back, they uh, was, as the Bible said, marveled at how Jesus was talking to this woman. But brothers and sisters, we need to have the mindset of Peter. And I want you to know what the mindset of Peter was. If you notice, um, if you would turn with me over to Acts 10 and verse 28. And this is what we need to be. Acts 10, verse 28. And he said says. unto them, Ye know how that, is, that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God had showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Mm. Yes, Jesus so, answered. So Peter said that, you know, it's unlawful. It's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into another's nation. In other words, he was saying that it's against the law for Jewish men to associate themselves with a Gentile. It was against their law for them to go into a Gentile home. They were unclean, considered to be unclean. It was against their religious belief. But Peter said that God showed him that he should not call any man common or impure or unclean. God showed him. And brothers and sisters, we need to have that same mindset. I pray that God show all of us that there's nobody that we should be looking at any differently than what we look at another man. We need to make sure that whoever we reach, whoever it is that are in our presence, that we share the word with them because, brothers and sisters, if we don't give it to them, where would they receive it from? We need to make sure that we're about doing the Father's business. And that's going to require crossing some boundaries because it's a whole lot of time. We don't like talking to people that don't look like us. That don't talk like us. But let me tell you a little secret, brothers and sisters. There's going to be a whole lot of folks in heaven that don't look like us. There's going to be a whole lot of folks in heaven that just don't talk like us. So therefore, brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we take this opportunity that we've given here to go out and spread this word, cross those boundaries that are there. Don't allow those fences to keep us from doing the will of the Father. We can't allow these differences to keep us from spreading the word. So we need to we need to make sure that we break these boundaries so that more people can come to know Jesus so that they, as well as we, all can receive the gift. And let me show you what that gift is. Uh, let's look at verse 10 of the text. Jesus answered and said unto her, And thou doest the gift of God. And who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink.